Welcome, Dr. James Beckett, Sports Card Insights, here with Brad Askew. We're going to talk about the recent Hall of Fame selections, uh, about two guys that I saw play. I, I watched a lot of baseball in the 50s, and actually, Benny Minoso and, and Gil Hodges are both pretty much perennial all-stars in the 50s. And when you go to the ballpark and who are the exciting players to watch. Minoso certainly fit that. Hodges, it's not that he was so exciting. He played on an amazing uh, team of Dodgers, mostly in Brooklyn. So they were a must-see as well. Let me thank the sponsors, and then we'll jump into discussion of Minoso and, and Hodges. Uh, Tops Panini, Upper Deck, Heritage Auctions, Huggins & Scott Auctions, Mike Stadium Sports Cards, Burbank Sports Cards, Compsy.com, and Beckett Media, Beckett Grading, Beckett Authentications. Brad, welcome to the show. You've been on before. Always enjoy your perspective. And you actually have some personal perspective of Minnie and Gil. So welcome to the show. And tell us why you're so happy that those guys got in. (laughs) Thanks, Jim. It's a pleasure to be with you as always. Uh, Yes, Hodges and Minoso both have a special place in my heart. I'm so excited that both of them got in. My dad grew up a Dodgers fan back in the 50s, like yourself. And his best friend, a gentleman named Reese Laughlin, who actually passed away earlier this year, My dad's been gone about 20 years, but Gil Hodges was Reese's favorite player. He loved Gil Hodges, and he and I, even in recent years, as he got became very elderly, we would talk a lot about how Hodges belongs in the Hall of Fame, and we even talked about maybe we'll go to Cooperstown together to go see him inducted, et cetera, that kind of thing. So obviously that didn't happen, and he just passed away this year, but Hodges was a great player, like you said. He was like an eight-time All-Star with the Dodgers. Obviously, Brooklyn was going to the World Series all the time. Uh, yeah. Back in the 50s and big power hitter, great gold glover, too. I think he won three gold gloves this time. But, but uh, Brad, was your friend Reese more enamored of Gil Hodges uh, because of the playing or because a lot of, of his of Hodges contemporaries really just said he's an even better man? I think it was some of that. It wasn't just the home runs and the RBIs. He, he really valued him as a man. And yeah, you're right. I actually several years ago found that there was a new biography that came out about Hodges and I bought two copies of it mailed one to Reese and, and he read it immediately and loved it and, and really appreciated me doing that. Also, many years ago, I gave him a double card holder with cards that I had of Hodges at 59 tops in the 1970, right after they won the World Series. So on the back, of course, it talks about him being the manager of the Miracle Mets. It was really cool, but you're right. It was character as well as playing. I think that really attracted Reese to, to Hodges and Therefore, through him and through my dad, I tried to meet the Hodges from that standpoint. He really has great statistics. He, he had a lot of power. He had fielding. He had a lot of different things and well-respected. But it defeats the notion that people usually think that if you're really well-liked and well-respected in the industry, you're, you're going to get the votes. And especially from the Veterans Committee. And, and Gil Hodges waited a really long time. He had the managerial success. Yeah. Uh, so uh, the only thing I can think of is that there was uh, too many Dodgers. <laughs> Part of, end. Part of it, I think, yeah. In fact, I read a book uh, a while back called The Cooperstown Case. talked about in one of the veteran years in the 90s, Hodges fell one vote short, and Ted Williams wouldn't let Roy Campanella vote. He was in ill health, couldn't make the trip to be there for the meeting, and they wouldn't let him vote. So long story short, if he'd let Campanella and not be in the room, he would have gotten in 25 years ago. Granted, he was already deceased then. He had died in the early 70s from a heart attack. So It's not like he would have been there, but still, he could have been in there a long time ago. He actually got over 60% of the vote from the writers twice, which is, obviously, it's not 75%, but 60% is pretty strong. Generally, if you get over 60% from the writers at one time or another, there's a darn good chance you're going to get to 75 eventually. Yeah, and you eventually do get in, but things are different now. But uh, do you think the hobby has already anticipated this? Because I have an account on Comp C. And I had a flurry of Gil Hodges sales. I didn't move up my price, but I, I mm-hmm. think he was priced as a really good player, maybe even a borderline Hall of Famer anyway. Always had popularity, but a, b- a bunch of them sold. Obviously, going back to the Beckett Magazine, I think Hodges would have always been listed as a star player in your listing of each set. And I think Minoso would have been the same way from that standpoint. Minoso, less so. I think yeah, I would agree. less well understood. Nowadays, these young players come up when they're 20 or 21 or 22. I think Hodges and Minoso both were mid-20s, at least, by the time they got up there. And Minoso, I think there's still question of how old he really yes. was. Based on the sketchiness of his age, some people think he might have been as old as 28 when he first got to the majors, which you missed five, six years of prime, probably, or early career. And he'd gotten in at that point instead of you know being in the Negro Leagues all that time, like Jackie and everybody else, waiting for 1947. 
if he'd been able to get in there four, five, six years earlier, instead of a little under 2,000 hits, he would have had 2,500 to 3,000 hits, and he would have had all the more staff. And also, even though I never saw him play, because obviously he played well before my time, from the time Dad and I started collecting in the early 80s, for whatever reason, I was just attracted to him as a player, maybe from what I read about him, maybe it was his name. I knew how flamboyant he was as a player, base stealer, incredibly popular in, in Chicago and stuff. His 56 tops card is probably my favorite. It shows him sliding you know, really hard into second base. And you can see how his spectacular play and just what kind of a player he was. And he had a great reputation among players and the Latin players, including Clemente, of course, who you love. They loved the guy because he was that generation before them and really helped to pave the way for them to come in. In fact, in that same book about the Cooperstown Chronicles, there's a quote from Cepeda, Orlando Cepeda. He says, Orestes Minoso was the Jackie Robinson for all Latinos, the first star who opened doors for all Latin American players. He was everybody's hero. I wanted to be Minoso. Clemente wanted to be Minoso. So that's a quote from Orlando Cepeda from a book about Latin players in the major league. So that's pretty cool that he kind of opened the way for Cepeda and, and Clemente and so many others that came after him. Let's talk about age, because nowadays, when you hear about somebody cheating on their age, it's yeah. so they can drink you know, or, or, or do something <laughs> that it's to be older than you are. But you could make a case for Minoso wanting to be younger or older, depending on how you look at it. And for so it. I'm sure he has a birth certificate. I haven't seen it. But if he right. was born in 23, that means his 52 Bowman and Topps cards, he's almost 29. Uh, yeah, he's, he's 28 right. something, 28 and a half during the season. That's sure. pretty cool to be a rookie. Now he wasn't a rookie. He played. He came up in 49, but even right. then, he was born in 23. He's a 26 year old rookie. Nowadays, right. people don't even want to prospect on the older rookies. But what if he was born in 25? If he was born right. in 25, that makes him a little younger. But if you think about you know, getting out of Cuba and wanting to be recognized, maybe looking older it gave you more adult status or something, or or more respect. Whereas right. now there are stories of prospects who were 25 who said they were 21 <laughs> so, right. so that the scouts would sign them up. Uh, right. But Minoso. That happens all the time. Or they would sometimes they would you know, say they were older in order to be able to get signed. Exactly. Really exactly. 16. And then, and then yeah, we're back. Yeah. So, right. so the games with age have been going on for a long time. But in the sports card insights, the player's age does matter. Regardless Absolutely. of what it says there, usually it's accurate, but in some cases it might not be. Right. You'd rather have a 22 year old star up and comer than a 28 year old up and comer. Absolutely. Uh, Noso hit the ground running. He played literally and figuratively. He really played the game all out. And I think that's what Clemente appreciated. And he did the same thing. When I look at Hall of Fame, I look at how many all-star games, what the peers thought, not just the sports writers, but the peers. And I think Minoso and uh, Hodges both were highly respected, selected to all-star games, part of winning teams. Although in baseball, if you're not on the winning team, it could be because your team has terrible pitching or you're a great hitter, but they pitch around you. But Minoso was an exciting ball player. Okay, I've got a, a conspiracy question for you. All right. What do you make of the fact that, that Minoso broke a color line of sorts? He was a black Cuban. He was a black person, but he was Cuban. He paved the way, and mm -hmm. I'm, I'm happy about that. But right. what, you correlate that with the fact that he got hit by pitch so many times? I heard that same thing. That was something I was going to mention. He got hit by pitch like 200 times, which led the majors or led his league eight or 10 times or something I heard. Yeah, I'm sure that's a lot of that was probably driven by, we don't want this guy here. Let's pluck him. I don't know how much of it might've been his stance or how aggressive he was up on the plate or just flat out racial hatred or some of both. I don't really know, but you got to figure it out. Maybe. Yeah. I, like I said, I'm just floating it out there, but I don't right. think we can be judge and jury after the pitches. I think, I think he was a lot of the great hitters in the fifties were bad ball hitters. They thought they could hit. It didn't matter whether it's in the strike zone. But if you're looking for something outside, the pitcher comes inside, you, you get nicked. And you're going to get clogged if you're out there, yeah. But they, yeah. the other thing I look at is whether or not these hit by pitches, are they knocking the guy out of the game? Are they breaking his arm? Are they beating him? Are they hitting him in the head? Or is right. it one of these? Uh, he took one on the arm and just jogged his way to first base laughing. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah, whatever. But it's, yeah. it's not actually, if you're leading the league every year hit by pitch, but again, but still respected, it seemed like, by the other players. Yeah, I mean, he, yeah, like you said, he made his all-star teams. He, he led the league in stolen bases. He was 
you know, dynamic player, obviously well respected by the other Latin players and such, but I think there was also probably respect from the other players as well. You know, Minoso came up as a third baseman. I didn't know that because he mainly was an outfielder. He was a left fielder for the yeah. White Sox mainly. Right. He traded from the Indians because they didn't have room for him, but he was immediately a really good player for the White Sox. Yeah, he's the beloved. He's, I know his numbers have been retired by the White Sox forever. The, the, um, yeah, the Indians were the Dodgers of the American League in terms of breaking the color line. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Larry Doby. Right. Page, they had Larry Doby and Minoso. Right. So That's what's going to happen with Minoso's cards? Because I don't think there's been a little bit of anticipation, but I think Hodges was already somewhat right. of Hall of Fame pricing. Minoso, right. not so much. Yeah, obviously the 52 Bowman, I'm sure, is the most expensive Minoso card. And I, you know, I own one, but what are we talking, 125, 150 bucks on those in reasonable condition, I think? Last week, this week, maybe not. Yeah, man, man this week, maybe a good bit more. There's, exactly. room, there's room for those to go up. Hodges yeah. could go up a little bit. Minoso could go up a lot. Right. Minoso, Minoso yeah. on your wall? That's an interesting question. I imagine Hodges might have been on your wall. No, Hodges on my wall. Minoso, 52. Hodges... Not sure what's on there, but it, I don't like putting the uh, smaller Bowman format on the wall because they don't look as good in the BGS holders. Agree. Uh, that's the other thing I go by. If I'm going to have a thousand players, celebrities, good players, Minoso yeah. would be on my wall. Yeah. Rogers would be on my wall. You yeah. know, I, that would have been the case regardless of whether they got in the Hall of Fame. Oh, it's really, I mean, it's really fun. A thousand on the wall, there's a good chance probably three or four hundred of them may be baseball. And exactly. they would clearly and they're, and, and, and they're clearly worthy in that realm. They're worthy of that because there's how many guys are in the Hall of Fame now? 300 or so? I think they were in that range too, as far as players. And I've actually got pretty cool memento. I've got the Hall of Fame postcards with their plaques. Yeah, yeah. I have the whole book of every one of them and I update it every year with the new one. So it's a neat book to have every one of the plaques in a book. And it'll be nice to add Minoso and Hodges and the others to that. We're just talking about Hodges and Minoso. Both those guys stayed in the game to some degree after their playing career was over with coaching and managing and things like that and right. were a credit to baseball. I think that's a positive for getting in the Hall of Fame, and I think that's a positive, again, as a sports card insight, for card values being able to have an upside. Because if you, if you disappear and you're out of sight, out of mind, Minnie Minoso was making headlines – when he was an old guy in his 50s right. or uh, maybe even 60s, when he got up to the plate and he didn't even embarrass himself. Yeah, you know, he actually, that's in, in my run of all Minoso's cards, the last card I have. You may remember there's a 1977 Topps card, and it shows him as a record breaker as the oldest player. To, I think they, how do they phrase it? Oldest player to hit safely. So in 1976, he got a hit and he was up there at that point. The card. Claims he was 54 years of age in 1976 when he got a hit in the major leagues. It was a stunt, obviously, to do that, but still, it's pretty amazing. That wasn't a stunt because he got a hit. What was a yeah. stunt is four or five years later when he came back again so he could be in five decades. Exactly. Uh, I'd love to be able to step up the plate with one decade, much less five decades. And Gil Hodges both uh, they were iconic. I'm glad they're in the Hall of Fame. Brad, thanks for uh, sharing your stories. Uh, thanks, listeners, the Hall of Famers. Or, or what a lot of us collect. And we just added a couple more to our ranks. Actually, six more, but these are two we're talking about now. So thanks, Brad Askew. Thanks, listeners. Be back again tomorrow. The man in the house of cards. 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 Is to-